Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. So our patient is a 60-year-old gentleman complaining of a three-day history of abnormal vision, which he didn't seek medical emergency for because it was a holiday. So he doesn't, he can't describe it well, but he just says something is abnormal, but I can't tell what's the problem. He said that he had a sudden onset with a rather stationary course, and he was not known to be diabetic or hypertensive or have any significant medical or surgical history. So on examination, his vision is 6-6 six, six in both eyes. Everything checks out as normal. If you look at the fundus in both eyes, the media is clear, the optic disc is fine, the macula looks good. However, on closer look, you can appreciate that there are exaggerated arteriovenous crossings. You can see them all over. Um, this gave me a clue that maybe this patient has some sort of venous stasis or atherosclerosis happening, but nothing abnormal is striking here. So with further clinical evaluation, Ishihara was uh, normal, so color vision was intact, as well as an Amsler grid. So at this point, you're faced with one of two options. Either that decide that the patient is normal, these, these are just floaters, or the patient is malingering and send them their way, or you can consider that the patient is very assertive of their symptoms and maybe take the complaint a little seriously. So I decided to go with a neuroophthalmological assessment. I thought that if everything is normal anterior segment and posterior segment wise, then perhaps something happening on a deeper level. So I went with an OCT and a 24-2 automated visual field. And I said that this was urgent and it's better to be done today. So if we look at the OCT, it tells you that there is no cupping, the neuroretinal rim thickness is normal, so is the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, so nothing much is happening on the optic nerve. However, when we look at the uh, visual field, we start to see something happening here. So the patient has a visual field that is uh, comparable in both eyes. This is a left homonymous field defect. So when we approach with a field defect like this, we need to just brush up a little bit on the visual pathway real quick. So the visual pathway we know starts with the cones and then the first order neuron, which are the bipolar neurons, the second order neuron at the lateral geniculate body, all the way back to the occipital radiation, uh, and then the occipital cortex. If we look at the visual field defects, if you affect the optic nerve, you have a complete visual field. If you affect the optic chiasm, you have a bitemporal visual field defect. If you have, affect the optic tract, you have a contralateral homonymous hemianopia and then a quadrantinopia and then all the way back to the visual cortex. So if we look at our patient's visual field, it's clear that when I asked for imaging, I said that the patient should be assessed specifically for the right chias chiasm and the retrochiasma pathway because this is what the visual field was pointing at. So at this point, it's important to brush up on what causes quadrantinopia in a wider survey. So this uh, retrospective study followed about 80 patients. So they discovered that patients with superior or inferior quadrantinopia, almost 80% of these cases were ischemic strokes. So I personally was under the impression that maybe there were other causes that would be more in common, but apparently 80% is an ischemic stroke, and 80% of these were in the occipital lobe. So the patient disappeared for six weeks. I had no idea what happened to him. And this is what he came in six weeks later and told me he did. He left the hospital, went to a, uh, a general hospital, so they had an MRI drawn, and they found that there, were, there was a large occipital infarction. So the patient was hospitalized the same day as a case of multiple subacute involving cerebral infarctions. He developed bulbar symptoms while admission. He has an extensive neurological and cardiological workup done, and he was determined to be an undiagnosed hypertensive patient, which is consistent with the arterial venous crossings that we saw on the fundus examination. So uh, he had an MRA done to assess the posterior cerebral circulation. He was started with anticoagulations and then was discharged from hospital 12 days later. So he's scheduled for a cerebral catheterization because uh, his cardiologist and neurologist did not think that the normal MRA was uh, conducive to the picture that he had. So unfortunately, when I saw the patient six weeks later now, his vision was down to 0.2. He had a wandering look, which was signaling a progression in his visual field defect, and he had a slightly attached a gate. This is the MRA that he had during admission. Now we can see that he has also a cerebellar infarction. This explains his ataxic gait. He has a pontine infarction, which explains the bulbar symptoms that he developed, and of course the occipital infarction that we've seen earlier on. This was uh, the MR at geography, and it was normal, which is why they decided to go for the catheterization.
So how, uh, how common do you think patients w which develop an infarction are going to get others? So this is a nice paper that shows you that almost 22.5% of patients with an occipital infarction will move on to get another infarction uh, within a six-month time frame. The risk factors are age, the sylvian border involvement, the family history of vascular disease, as well as all the other uh, risk factors that we know, such as diabetes and hypertension and smoking. So, are we able to predict which patients are going to get these field effects? Maybe, perhaps. So this paper decided to d divide these uh, lesions into lesions affecting the occipital radiation and then the striate cortex, the occipital pole, and the occipital convexity, and then mapped these changes based on the paracentral or central field defects. And this is what they found. They found that the lesions that affected the posterior pole uh, 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 for causing lower quadrants, these are the ones that had the best diagnosis later on and best prognosis. However, lesions that affected the occipital pore, the striate cortex, and the occipital convexity, those are the ones that had the worst uh, prognosis later on. So if we look at our patient, he had all three, which is why he did develop a, 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 a deterioration of his visual field. So are we really helpless? Is there anything that we can do for these patients? So this nice paper from NYU in New York, um, they decided to uh, train patients which have visual field defects from quadrantinopias, from occipital stroke specifically, and and this is what they find. They give them uh, uh, patterns of different frequencies and they tell them to go home and they practice these patterns at home. And this is what they found. If you look at the red curve, this is the intact field. When you plot the contrast sensitivity with the increasing frequency of the pattern, you can see that this is what a normal field would look like. However, the blue is a patient with a blind field before starting training. And then the green is after the patient started training. So you can see that there is a, a statistically significant difference in the contrast sensitivity appreciated by the patient patients after this exercise. So the take-home messages from our patient is you have to keep an open mind to your patient's complaints. If everything is normal, nothing is just floaters. You, you should consider what they're talking about. The risk factors are risks, but the patient can present without very clear ones. Uh, there is more to vision than visual acuity. 6-6 six, six isn't always normal. You should consider visual field and color vision as well. Visual fields save lives. You have to keep them in mind when nothing else seems wrong. And approximately 80% of quadratinopias are strokes, so you have to act fast, a life is potentially in the balance. And thank you very much for your attention.